All right. Good morning, Truckee. This is a uh, great group this morning. Thanks for everybody coming out and joining us uh, early this morning and in person. This is uh, not on Zoom this morning, so all of you are seeing it. You're the uh, the originals, the one and onlys, and then it's going to be recorded later if you want to catch it again or tell any about anybody about it. So we have a great program this morning about new leaders here in Truckee. And we're going to feature Rob Galloway, who's the new publisher for the Sierra Sun. Rob assumed that role in June after serving as the publisher for the Tahoe Tribune. And we have Louis Ward, the chief operating officer of Tahoe Forest Health System. And Louis comes to Truckee from the Myers Memorial Hospital District. And not new to Truckee, but new to the position is Kevin McKechnie in the Truckee, excuse me, Truckee Fire Protection District Fire Chief. And then finishing out the program is the one and only Chamber of Commerce's new CEO and President, Jessica Penman. And Jessica comes to Truckee after working at the Yountville Chamber of Commerce. So thanks everybody for coming this morning. We're going to have a great presentation. Before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsors, Tahoe Forest Health System, Our Back Engineering, Dixon Realty Truckee Tahoe, JK Architecture Engineering, NV5, Porter Simon, Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, Tahoe Truckee Media, Sierra Sun, Moonshine Inc., 101.5 FM Truckee Tahoe Radio, the Town of Truckee, and the Truckee Tahoe Airport District. And as always, we couldn't do this without the committee that puts this all together. So thanks to the Chamber staff, and Jessica Penman, Lynn, Ruth Garcy, Carolina Pacheco, Melissa Williams, and Brenda Stark. And then we have Kelly Cutler of CAT, Miumi Elegato, uh, changed last name, I apologize, Miumi. She's been married. Moonshine Inc., Ernie Grossman, Gerald Herrick, the Fire Department Board, Tony Lashbrook, Jim Porter of Porter Simon, Deb Ryan of TTCF, and Ted Owens of the Tahoe Forest Health System. And as always, thanks to Rory in the back room making the tech possible in the mic, and this will be recorded. You can go to truckee.com and find a link if you'd like to watch it again. So as always, and this may take a little longer because we have great participation this morning, we're going to go around the room and do some introductions. So why don't we start right here with you, Amy. Yes. I'm Jessica Pemmin. I am the new president and CEO of the chamber, and you'll hear more from me in a minute. Colleen, you want to go to this table? Yeah. Siobhan Penny, uh, director of sustainable tourism for Visit Chuck Tahoe. Karen Wilkex with the North Lake Tahoe Turkey Leadership Program. Ronnie Roberts, the public conservation officer for the town of Becky. Jan, go ahead. Actually, if everybody can stand up so we can see you. We don't have a mic this morning. Jan, I wasn't making fun, you know. <laughs> yeah, so Jan Zabriskie, uh, Truckee Town Council, and I'm a candidate for re-election. Go ahead. Liz, why don't you go ahead? You want to start back there? Mary 
Jen, you want to go? All right, let's jump to Bill Greeno's table so we don't forget. Okay. We'd never forget you, Bill. <laughs> oh, selling herself the lawyer in town. If you have criminal needs, especially. <laughs> All right, what do you guys want to go here? Sorry, go ahead. I missed you. Ted Owens. Yeah, I know. Ted Owens, Tall Forest Health System. I'm also a member of the Chamber Board and the Land Trust. And I'm not running for anything. Good morning. He's a great attorney at Porter Simon and a new partner as well. Chris Bennett, Mount Lincoln Construction. Jake Hudson, NB5, and Truckee River Watershed Council Board. Uh, Chris Parker, Sugar Bowl, Royal Gorge, uh, Truckee Trails Foundation, and Dr. Association. Uh, Brian Hunt, architect, and volunteer with Sierra Community House and and in the very back there, forgot your table. Yes. Hi, I'm Mike Daniel, uh, running for the Truckee Tahoe Airport District. Marisol Rocha, I'm Dana All right, did I forget anybody? anybody? Rory O'Farrell, Tahoe Truckee Medium. <laughs> there you go. And Len. <laughs> All right. All right, well with that, thank you again for coming. We're going to start with Rob Galloway this morning. And as I said, he's the publisher of the Sierra Sun. He started his career in media with the Nevada Appeal in Carson City in 2002. Following his 10 years there, Rob took on the position for the key account advertising manager with the Reno Gazette Journal before becoming the publisher of the Tahoe Tribune in 2016. In recent years, Rob has also been assisting the Sierra Sun as the ad director, so please welcome Rob Galloway. And uh, remarkably, he lets myself and Jim Porter publish in his paper, so thank you. All right, I appreciate it. I was actually kind of happy that uh, I got to bat lead off for this presentation because I think I'm the only one who doesn't actually have a presentation. I'm gonna go old school. I just got notes here, I'm just gonna talk. Um, I thought it was kind of awkward, at least when I was trying to figure out how do I let people know a little bit about myself. Um, that, int that introduction was pretty good. Um, uh, but I'll go over some of that, but I just didn't know wh what do I put up there to talk about myself. I felt a little awkward in doing so, but, uh, but I'm, I'll talk a little bit about myself and then I'll dive into maybe the sun a little bit more specifically about um, what I see from a, from a newspaper or a news media side of things and then maybe some just some things about what we are experiencing on that side of things and how we might interpret that to, to move the sun forward. But um, 
as I dive into to myself, uh, I grew up in a, in a very small town. Um, when I say small town, it's less than 2,000 people. Um, a couple counties over, Calaveras County, uh, the town of Murphy's, California, if anybody knows the town of Murphy's, California, that's where I grew up. That's where I call home. Uh, my wife's family lives in Angel's Camp. My family still lives in Murphy, so we still visit there quite frequently. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring it up is because I felt like being in that town um, really helps when you think about working and covering news in a small town, especially in a small town like Truckee. Um, now Murphy's, it isn't the mountain town that Truckee is, but it is a, a foothill town. And um, we saw our, we still see it, our share of visitors or, you know, flatlanders as we used to call them back in the day. Um, they compete, uh, contribute a big part to that local economy. economy. Um, and while maybe most people know most people around town, each town, if you know that, that Gold Country corridor, that Highway 4 corridor, each town is very different from one another. Um, they all experience their own little things, um, but there is some wider things from the county perspective that people um, need to know about. And I equate that a little bit to, you know, whether it's Truckee or Tahoe City or Kings Beach or Incline Village, all those things, you know, there's some things that, that connect the fabric of those communities, but they're also very, very different. Um, and I think just having that experience within that coverage area or growing up in that area really helps lend itself well to what I'm doing now. Um, so I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit to uh, uh, my career in media. Um, as the introduction said, I was with the Nevada Appeal. Um, I started on the advertising side of things. Um, and during that time, during my 10 years there, I worked basically in every type of business vertical selling advertising. Um, I also spent a lot of time on the back end for production and layout. Uh, a lot of things I was also in control of um, uh, our, what we called our group publications at the time. Um, if anybody has been in town for a while, you might know that the Sierra Sun was part of what we call the Tahoe Carson Area Newspaper Group, or TCAN, as we like to call it. Um, that later uh, developed into Swift Communications, um, but that group did include the Sierra Sun, and given the charge that I had as far as managing the magazines for the entire group, um, I worked in every single market that we operated in. So I know the region and I've been around in the region for you know over 20 years, especially on the media side of things. Um, that 10 years, it came to uh, an end when a former boss of mine, a publisher of mine, she moved to the Reno Gazette Journal. She took a job with, the, um, with them as their advertising director and she recruited me over to the RGJ um, to be their key account sales manager. And that role, um, it basically was managing the team that managed our largest book of business. And at that time, it was about seven and a half million dollars. Um, so if anybody knows RGJ, they are owned by Gannett, who at that time, I mean, they still have the flagship publication of USA Today. But at that time, they haven't spun anything, any of their, their TV business off yet. So it was just one extremely large company, as you can imagine. Um, and given my experience there, I think one of the best things that I took away from that is on the digital side of things where I learned just digital solutions for advertisers, but then also more importantly, just the back end of content and how we can use digital to really hone our content in. Um, part of that led to me helping be part of the team that launched the reno.com URL. And uh, we actually bought that from my former company, so that was a little weird. Um, but uh, but it, was, it was a great experience nonetheless. Uh, but at that time, I mean, there are pros and cons to having worked for a family-owned media corporation, which Swift Communications was, and then something that was beholden to shareholders. Now, me being a small town guy, I kind of gravitated towards the, uh, the family side of things, as you could probably expect. And then um, in, after four years there, I actually got a call from the COO uh, for Swift Communications, and he offered me, well, didn't offer me, I had to go through the process, but um, he, uh, eventually I, I took the position of the publisher for the Tahoe Daily Tribune in South Lake Tahoe. And I've been there for the past six and a half years. Um, and in that time, a hell of a lot has happened with our group of, of papers um, or media outlets uh, in the region here. A lot of them have been bought and sold. I've held multiple positions in addition to my position as the, uh, the publisher of the Tahoe Tribune um, and the Sierra Sun. They've seen a, a few management changes, uh, most recently with me taking the publisher position in June. Um, you know, I've always looked at change as a catalyst for growth. Um, so I like to look at anytime anything changes, what can we learn and maybe most importantly, how do we grow from this type of change? Um, so when I look at, um, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things because before I dive into the sun specifically, I think it's important for everybody to know just some landscape stuff from the media side of things. And uh, I mentioned it earlier. If, if, if some of you heard me talk, uh, I, I talked about it in a rotary presentation not too long ago. I'm going to regurgitate some of the things from that presentation. So if you heard it before, I'm sorry. But, uh, but I think it's important for people to know and understand from a news perspective what people can think of or what we're dealing with on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, and since the pandemic, there's been over 360 newspapers that have closed, uh, but since 2004, there's been over 1,800. Um, that's about a quarter of local newspapers. That averages more than a two per week. It did slow down a little bit after the pandemic, but uh, there was a recent report, it's called the State of News 2022, um, that said the country is set up to lose one third of its newspapers by 2025. Um, you know, I truly believe that yeah, at my core, given uh, my, my small town values here, uh, that newspapers are extremely valuable, especially in a small town, um, because any of the communities that we serve, we really tried to be and cover that information that makes it so important for, for people in the local communities to know. I'm really passionate about it. Uh, I feel like well-informed citizens really make the, um, the best decisions or the smartest decisions about their community. Um, if you think about you know, city councils or school boards or planning commissions, any of those people that meet without reporters recording the information that is in those meetings and letting the community know what happens, um, bad decisions are gonna be made. If there's nobody there to cover it, you really, uh, there's been quite a few studies um, that have shown that politicians, they spend more recklessly, government is less efficient. Um, if you don't have people holding people accountable for the decisions or the information that they give out and conduct with the community. So uh, I don't know if anybody has heard the term, I don't know if it's relatively new, it's somewhat relatively new. Uh, it's a term called news deserts. Um, it's a place basically where residents have limited access to news and information to help make informed decisions. And that same report, it found that one fifth of the population lives in a news desert or is at risk of being in a news desert. And how does that number, or how, what does that look like from an actual number? That's 70 million people that live in the 208 counties without a newspaper or in the 1,630 counties that only has two newspapers. Um, in these areas, if you could imagine, I'm sure you can, um, how the majority of these people get their information, and it's from social media. And everybody's heard that term, fake news, I'm sure, um, but social media, while there has definitely been some good things that have come out of social media, it really has challenged society. Um, I think in a very negative way. I've written about it a few times, um, but quite simply, social media, it is fact challenged. Um, and we have to, uh, as a news organization, we have to overcome those challenges every single day all day long. Um, and I did actually recently talk about, um, it was in an Incline Village um, library meeting um, where we were discussing the First Amendment. And it seemed like every single part of that discussion that we had, it eventually came back around to social media. Um, it's definitely one of the hardest challenges that we have. Um, and for all of the, uh, you can call it bashing, call it whatever you want, people have done, especially maybe over the last two to three years, uh, that they have seen about national media or the, the scrutiny that national media has become, all of that stuff rubs off on local news outlets. Um, whether people know it or not, you speak about something, it, you could be speaking about national media, but people do not disseminate they still feel media is media. Um, so we get challenged with that. Um, you know, I feel like as local media, our main goal is basically just inform citizens. Inform citizens. That's just plain and simple. We want to inform citizens. Um, you know, if we can get a certain amount of people to feel like we're leaning left and the same amount of people that feel like we're leaning right, it that probably means we're right where we need to be because we're, we're trying to be that, that, you know, that area that be, gives both sides equal attention to it. I'm not going to say, you know, we're always going to be there. We try to be there. Um, sometimes we, you know, we might not get enough information for the other side to be, uh, to be in that middle, but that's really what we strive for. Uh, there was actually a, um, a recent Pew Research study uh, that said 68% of Americans believe news media outlets, uh, they favor, they play favorites on partisan and social issues. Uh, local media got a little bit better marks than that, but still, um, it was about 25% of Americans don't trust local news. Um, I really wish that number was lower, um, and it's different in different communities, but the local community should be able to trust their local media. Um, most of the time, local news outlets, we are the point for people to get vetted information from and know what's going on. And that's really at the pinpoint of what we try to do, what we strive to do, and what we hope you can expect from us. Um, and I'm one to always say, if you, 
if you ever have anything to say, you feel free to give me a call and tell me. Um, I'm, my, my door's always open, my phone's always open. Um, but the FCC, they have identified eight specific categories of information that they say residents in every community need in order to make informed decisions. That's emergency, uh, that's both immediate emergencies, think of like wildfire, uh, and long-term emergencies. Uh, health and welfare, that is considered one. Education, transportation, economic opportunities, the environment, civic information, and political information. All of these are what we call um, in our office on our, on our editorial side of things, content pillars, uh, basically subjects that we basically use to help drive um, how we look at news and, and what we need to make sure that we are covering. Um, and as we look towards the future of the sun, we, we'll find that, we'll fine tune that a little bit. Um, and when I say fine tune, if you think of like um, the environment side of things, we'll probably fine tune that to be like fire and water, things of that nature. So that's what I mean when I say fine tune. Uh, but between the sun and the tribune, we have two states, we have five counties and that's a awful big uh, part of what we try to cover we don't have a big team um, but that's a lot to try and make sure that we have an understanding of uh, two states and five counties um, it's just everybody's a little bit different but if you think about the Sierra Sun in the community um, it's been here for 153 years um, since 1869 there's a hell of a lot of history behind that we're trying to learn and understand the history of the Sierra Sun while we're trying to balance our everyday lives and how we go about tracking the news and how things constantly change with social media or online or you know given anything that we have today but um over those 153 years a primary way of delivering news has been the newspaper um and if i look at how the newspaper relates to our audience um, to give you an idea we reach about 18,750 readers in print each week it's basically about a uh, two and a half readers per copy but if you look at our online, we're on pace to reach over 1.5 million unique visitors this year. That doesn't include our social channels, that doesn't include our newsletter, um, that doesn't include our e-edition. Um, it, it basically what it boils down to is we have to make sure that we are in the right place or in front of the right people when they are consuming news. So some people might read the paper, some people might read online. We have to make sure that we are balancing those things effectively to try and get as much information to the community as we possibly can. But it also means we need to do our due diligence and make sure that the stories that we are telling are the right stories. Um, if it's more in depth, uh, we want to look at data and analytics to make sure people are interacting with them, to make sure that the stories that we're telling are actually getting read um, or passed along or engaged with. Um, we also need to be, make sure that we're not afraid to try new things. Uh, that can mean new contributors, new topics, deeper dives in topics that we haven't really given enough attention to or just, again, looking at those metrics to figure out what's resonating most with community. Um, I, did, I will say I've seen some pretty promising data on some of the article engagements that we've, that we've, we've made a few tweaks on the back end, um, and we can see it in our numbers. So it says we're doing something right. Um, if we really look at you know, local news on, on that side of things, I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, we just wanna make sure that we are looking to find those solutions for the community and that you are feeling like we are doing what we need to be doing to get you informed. And again, if there's anything that you ever need from me or you feel like we're not doing, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you, Rob Galloway of the Sierra Sun. Um, we're gonna hold all questions until the end just because we had a lot of introductions this morning. So if you have questions, we'll do it right before the stump speeches. Up next, we have Louis Ward of the Tahoe Forest Health System, and he comes to Truckee after many years of working with the Myers Memorial Hospital District. He's now the Chief Operating Officer for the uh, system, and he's helping bringing the governing board's visions to the best mountain healthcare system, maybe in the nation, in the certainly country. in the region. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. Well, good morning, Truckee. Uh, everyone hear me okay? All right, perfect. Uh, so yeah, this morning, I, I'm just delighted to be here with all of you. It's great to be here in person. I've actually met a number of you through Zoom, and so... <laughs> just uh, great to be here and actually in the same room working with all of you so I, I did bring a little presentation um, I actually am gonna go a little bit more into myself than the health system but I'll end with the health system uh, but I think relationships are really important I come from a very small town and so relationships are really what drove 
all of our success uh, in that small town. So I wanted to share a little bit about myself and my family. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, so before we go into that, I'm from a small town called Fall River Mills, California. And Rob stood up here and said, you know, 2,000 people, small town. This is a town of about 600 people, so a <laughs> little, little smaller even. Uh, the health system I worked at, we serviced about 18,000 people in that far northeastern corner of California. You can see there's a little red dot. I tried to put a little map there, but it's right up in the, in the northeastern part of California, wedged in with Oregon and Nevada. Uh, very, very rural town. Uh, my only you know, potential traffic was when the ranchers moved cows across the road. You just had to be real careful not to get involved in that. Uh, but really, an amazingly beautiful part of California. If you haven't been, I really recommend going. Who's been to Fall River before? Oh, look at that. We got some people. Okay, good. Some fisher fishermen and um, golf. 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 Yeah, we have a, an amazing golf course up there. We're lucky to have that. Uh, so one of the other really huge things up there is uh, Bernie Falls. And so those are my two youngest there standing in front of Bernie Falls. Uh, so we could jump onto the next slide. Uh, the hospital that I came from is called Mayor's Memorial Hospital District. Uh, about the same age as the Tahoe Forest Health District kind of came, came to fruition about the same time. Um, it is a critical access hospital. For those of you that don't know what a critical access hospital is, it's a hospital that has less than 25 beds. It's 35 miles away from the next hospital. It's really part of that, um, you know, healthcare network that, that needs to be there because you know, you have traffic accidents, you have a number of things that happen out in those rural areas. And so uh, we're pretty good at making sure that a helicopter can land and, and move people along. Uh, so the picture up on the top left is what the hospital looked like when I got there uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, we were very fortunate to be at a time where we needed a new hospital and we had a very supporting community, much like this community and we came together and we were able to uh, create a capital campaign that raised a significant amount of money and then of course uh, took out some loans some bonds and was able to actually build the hospital on the right side and that was the very last project i was a part of uh, before joining tahoe forest health system so uh, something i'll be my team and i there were very proud of to be able to leave uh, you know, something the community could be very confident in for many years to come. Uh, picture on the bottom left is just opening a, a actually a rural health clinic uh, in April of 2021. So right in the middle of COVID, we decided to start that project and get that going. And then the picture on the bottom right is actually myself and my family, and we were lucky enough to put the golden shovel in the ground. Uh, this was after the, you know, the politician photo and so forth, but uh, the kids really got a kick out of that. So that's, that's something that'll probably be on my wall forever and ever. Uh, so we can go on to the next one. Uh, all right, so, you know, where did I go to school and so forth? Uh, UCSF, I, I did a master's of healthcare administration there, master's of leadership there as well. Um, I went to Chico State. Any Chico State grads? Yeah. <laughs> right. Chico State. Um, I fond memories of Chico State. Uh, it's all based in academia. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and then I grew up in the Bay Area, so I went to Concord High School in the Bay Area as well. Uh, also fond memories of, of the Concord area, but I'm much, much happier living in smaller town than the Bay Area. All right, we go on. So this is, this is my crew. This is my family. So uh, we have four little kids, uh, all little redhead kids. So if they ever get in trouble, you guys will be the ones to be able to call me because um, they're pretty noticeable. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, Emma, who's 12, Corbin, who's 10. Stella is seven, and Callan is our, our little monster of the crew, uh, and he is four. So uh, they're there. Um, you know, all of, all of these pictures were actually taken at my house in Fall River, so it's a, kind of a real beautiful area. Uh, my wife and I, Ashley, there in the bottom 
on the left side and then I just wanted to throw in a snow picture because I was like all right I, I've dealt with a little bit of snow uh, not nearly as much as what I know is coming but um, you know I know how to push a snow shovel around all right so we could go on uh, I, I really wanted to share this with you, uh, having fun in Truckee. We have been so fortunate this year to just have immersed ourselves in the Truckee culture. Um, and it is a very, very good one. Uh, from somebody that's coming in, I, I don't know, you guys probably don't take these things for granted, but just the amount of yeah, community uh, involvement in a lot of these um, you know, really fun activities just amazed me this year. So my kids joined me. I got here in January. My kids joined after school. So they got here in the end of June. And we just have not stopped the whole time. So obviously we've got Lake Tahoe, uh, Squaw Valley, the, the village there at Squaw. And then uh, I put in a picture of, we went to every one of the, the concert in the parks. And that was neat. Um, We've dined out at most of the restaurants here. Uh, so on the bottom left, we're at Blue Coyote there. And then sports. You're going to see sports here in a second. But uh, my kids just love to make fun of everything. So there's four of them in a shopping cart, Safeway, I think. Uh, so they're just running around. Uh, so we can go on to the next one. Uh, so school. Uh, all of the kids have uh, now got into school. So we uh, have our oldest at Alder Creek Middle School. And we have our, uh, Corbin is in fourth grade at Glenshire, Stella is at second grade in Glenshire, and Callan is actually at the preschool at Tahoe Forest Health System. And then there's a little picture of them starting school the first day in front of Glenshire, but I, I just, I'll let you all know, they are having such a good time in school. Uh, they've made friends, they've, their teachers are amazing. I get emails every night, Ashley and myself get emails about, you know, what they're up to in school, and just the school system here is blowing me away, so it's just fantastic. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so sports. We are a huge sports family huge sports family so um, my son is currently playing for Truckee football so uh, we're out every Saturday playing football at this point uh, our boys are four and one uh, they until this weekend they were four and oh and they had beaten every other team 114 to nothing so uh, we got a good crew coming in maybe to our Truckee high school in about you know five six years um, I won't talk about Saturday's game. That, that still hurts. It's too soon. Um, but, uh, my wife and I are really, really big into sports. So we both coach. Uh, so I, I generally coach soccer. My wife uh, tries her hand at Little League. She's actually a really good coach. And so her and I uh, will usually try to do a Little League team together. Uh, so next year, right, we, we figured we'll get in this year and we'll kind of just figure out who's who, but we'd like to get back into coaching. And then uh, new to our family is rock climbing. Uh, so my daughter wanted to take up rock climbing, so that's the rec center and rock climbing. We can jump on to the next one. I told you sports is big, so sports continued. <laughs> so uh, golf, uh, the whole family is kind of figuring out golf at the moment. Um, we have a, a number of amazing golf courses here, and I know you guys know this, but it's awesome. Uh, okay, w who would we be in Truckee without e-bikes at this point, I guess, right? I, I see e-bikes everywhere, and so one of the first things my wife did was when got an e-bike and a big truck hat, and now we're like <laughs> Truckeeites, right? <laughs> so, uh, and then... We're huge 49er fans, uh, so we, you know, our 49er flag goes up on the house every Sunday or every game day. And then uh, just a picture there of my daughter picking up my son at the football game, and she is a diva, so she wears princess dresses all the time, and so she's picking them up. And then they just literally make a sport out of everything. This was just one day they wanted to try and get to the top of uh, a doorway, uh, we're frequent users of the ER as well, uh, just so you know. Uh, yeah, I joined healthcare so I could get a discount in healthcare, basically. All right, so we'll go on to the next one. Um, all right, so now getting to the health system a little bit. So, you know, I, I 
I've been around healthcare for a little, I mean, it's all I know really, right? So I got out of college and uh, Fall River, I, I grew up in the Bay Area, but my wife and I said, well, where do we go from here, you know, after school? And so we decided to go to Fall River. I said, well, where, you know, where would we work or, you know, how do we make money? And um, there was a hospital up there and they said, yeah, you know, come on board and, and we'll get you trained up. So I started off as the materials manager at Mayor's Memorial Hospital about 13 years ago and then decided pretty quickly, all right, I really enjoy healthcare. I, you know, it's being part of the community. Um, you know, I, that, I had that public administration degree and I figured like, how can I make this work? And also just, you know, really get involved with my, my neighbors and family and friends in a meaningful, positive way. And so I just, jumped into healthcare, went back, did school, did all of that, and then started progressing through that health system. One of the things that I ended up being able to do was I, I had such a fantastic team at Mayor's Memorial Hospital, they allowed me to actually expand out and start going into uh, state associations. So a few years ago, I was asked to sit on the board of the California Health, health Association, so uh, CHA, California Hospital Association, and uh, they asked me to sit in the rural seat, right? So there's nine members of the executive board throughout the state, and one person holds the, the rural seat. And that rural seat, also uh, Tahoe Forest Health System, is represented by that seat as well. So I got to spend a number of years doing that. I'm still doing that, actually. Um, and one of the very neat things I got to do was go and visit pretty much every critical access hospital in the state. Uh, my my wife, she'll tell you stories about this, but like we'd be driving to Disneyland and I'm like, hey, can we just take a left turn, drive 45 miles into the middle of nowhere so we could drive through this parking lot and see this hospital that I haven't seen yet. The only one I haven't seen is on Catalina Island. I just can't convince her to get on a boat and go across just to see a hospital. Um, but the, the point is, I knew about Tahoe Forest uh, well before coming here, and Tahoe Forest is an amazing hospital, right? That the work that's done here, the innovation that's done here, the talent that's here, and just kind of the the drive to be the best is not something that would be represented in every critical access hospital in the state and even in the nation. Uh, so when Harry called and said, "Would you be interested in coming?" even though I was very comfortable. And my wife and I, you know, we're raising our family and enjoying that experience. That was a hard thing to turn down, right? So uh, we had a lot of conversations about it, came and visited the community, talked with the staff. I'd already known Ted Owens, two minutes, all right. Ted, I'd already known Ted Owens for a number of years. I'd known Jake Dorst, Karen Buffone. Um, you know, I met Judy, my predecessor before this, and, I knew that this was a good team and that this team was driving this health system to be the best in the nation and that is something I wanted to be a part of. So uh, what's here in front of you is our foundations of excellence. Uh, essentially it's our mission, our vision, our values, but you know the vision is, is probably what drew me in the most and, and really that is to be the best mountain health system in the country. And I know that this team can do it. We're well on the way to doing it. There's some things we still need to work out. I'm sure that many of you have, have had stories or things that go on. And, um, you know, healthcare is, is a bit of an imperfect science. Um, but, you know, if you keep working at it and you've got a talented group of people, and we surely have those in our physicians and nurses and supporting staff, uh, you can achieve a lot. So uh, we, what I think is coming for the future of, of Tahoe Force Health System is we need to be nimble in terms of, you know, what, what kind of virtual health care do we want to c continue to still exist, right? I, I think we're coming off of two, two and a half years of kind of this general adoption of, of some, you know, virtual aspect of our lives. You know, what makes sense? What makes it convenient? Uh, you know, are there ways that when simple medication refills, maybe it, it, it can happen in a different way than having to wait a week or two weeks or, or sometimes even more? 
Uh, maybe you can do it very quickly and electronically. So there's a lot that, that's coming with healthcare, but access is a huge part of, of our concern at the moment. So we want to make sure that we can see all of you and your families and friends in a quick, timely way. So that, that's what we're going to be focusing on. And I do have one last slide because I just really want to talk one little bit about the team at Tahoe Forest. They're just such a fantastic team. Uh, full of passion and dedication and what really really you know brought me and and the, those folks in the picture to this community to to be part of this is it is a community hospital right we get to serve our neighbors our friends our families our kids teachers our kids coaches and, and that's what makes it special that's what makes us really lean in and try to figure out how to do it better every day so I am delighted to be here with all of you. I want to work with all of you in the future. And lastly, the last slide is my contact information. Write it down. That's my cell phone number. You can text, call me anytime you want because I want to be part of your you know, good healthcare experience here in this town. So thank you for the time this morning, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. All right, Louis Ward, Chief Operating Officer of the uh, Tahoe Forest Health System, and after the presentation this morning, I guess uh, unofficial marketing director for the town of Truckee. So, well, well done there. All right, Kevin McKechnie is up next. He's with the Tahoe Fire Protection District, and he is the new fire chief as of June of this year, and he was previously the deputy fire chief. So, please welcome Kevin. All right, thank you. All right, so. Uh back-to-back -back Chico State guys. How often does that happen? You guys are lucky today. I um, also want to throw a little uh, small town publishing out. Uh, my grandfather was a small town publisher up in Red Bluff. So um, yeah, so thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin McKechnie, Fire Chief for the Truckee Fire Protection District. Uh, this gives me an opportunity to think about my new role as the Fire Chief and uh, assemble and present some of my thoughts uh, on the work that we do and the value that we add back into the community. At Truckee Fire, we strive to, de to uh, develop leaders from within. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks of our organizational stability. Uh, we take hardworking followers and we provide them with the opportunity to shape and lead the organization into the future. Uh, this can be draw there can be drawbacks with this and some bumps in the roads. You know, earlier this year, I was in a meeting with Insurance Commissioner Lara, uh, Nevada County CEO Lehman, and uh, County Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, it's not hard for me to look around that room and say, what am I doing here? You know, um, I'd much rather be driving a fire engine. Um, but here we are, you know, please bear with me. I'm a bit nervous, you know, just getting used to these new adornments on my uniform. Um, but I know with your support, uh, we'll get through it, we'll make things better, and uh, we're going to keep Truckee thriving. Slide. Uh, yeah, so I'll do a, a little introduction on my background. Um, you know, we'll talk about the fire district, right? It's such a unique and awesome place uh, to work and to serve. Um, you know, sort of a little status report on, on the fire district. You know, we'll talk about some critical infrastructure, uh, level of service, uh, some of the needs we might have, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, slide, yeah. So uh, my Truckee, um, our, excuse me, my family moved to Truckee in 1972, right? So a lot of changes in 50 years. Hard to believe 50 years ago. Uh, so this little mill town, these we've come a long way, right? And thankfully, we weren't eliminated by the Truckee bypass, right? <laughs> it could have happened. <laughs> Uh, so I graduated from uh, Truckee High School in 1988. I went to Chico State, studied engineering. Uh, I, after I got my degree, I went to Los Angeles and worked for the construction division in Caltrans. Um, overall, LA, right, not the place for me. Not really my kind of town. Uh, but I had some good experiences there and, and I had some fun. Um, while I was there, I got to work on the response and recovery to the Northridge earthquake, right? Pretty fascinating for a new engineer. Uh, I got my pilot's license while I was down there. 
And I got laid off uh, by Governor uh, Wilson, Pete Wilson's reduction in force, right? Uh, so that can happen too. So uh, back to Truckee, that brought me back home, uh, back in Truckee in 1995, uh, working in the construction industry, building a house. You know, I was always com uh, a little curious about emergency medicine, right? So I signed up for CR College. I got my EMT from Jan Noseworthy. Uh, in 2001, uh, I became a volunteer firefighter following in my dad's footsteps. And my first big call was the Martis Fire. That was on Father's Day 2001. Uh, in 2005, I was offered a full-time job and an opportunity to go to paramedic school. Over the next 14 years, I moved up through the ranks from fire captain to battalion chief. And in 2019, I took sort of a big jump in the fire service and went to do fire prevention, right? Uh, I became the fire marshal. I found the work of fire prevention to be fascinating. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to go to the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland and study fire investigations. And with that, I've been involved with the implementation of the fire code for the last few years. And so this career path has sort of put me in position to be the fire chief. Um, you know, I hold this position in great regard. It's a privilege and honor to be your fire chief. Slides, so uh, I'm married. I got two teenage boys. Uh, my, wife, my wife, Wendy, uh, teaches third grade at the Glenshire Elementary School. Uh, Carter is a sophomore at Truckee High. He's playing football, and uh, he's a student driver. He's doing great, <laughs> super cautious, right? Uh, Brody's an eighth grader at Alder Creek Middle School. He is growing like a weed. He loves basketball. Uh, I think I still got him by about a half an inch, but pretty soon he's going to be taller than me. And then we got Coco Loco, the pound hound there. Uh, he's our pandemic rescue, um, thanks to the Truckee Humane Society. Okay, so that's a little background on me. Let's talk about the fire district. I come to work each day with a huge feeling of gratitude. I'm so grateful for the men and women that show up to serve this community as part of the Truckee Fire Protection District. We serve a large area, 125 square miles, right? Uh, to the Nevada State Line, Blue Canyon, um, up north to the Little Truckee Summit, and to the south to, uh, you know, to support our, our partners over there at North Star and Olympic Valley. Uh, we run about 3,000 calls for service per year. Uh, the staff for the fire district, they carry a huge burden for this community. As you know, we show up when people are having what could be the worst day of their lives. Um, <clears throat> we don't do it alone. There are many other first responders and I tip my cap to our allied agencies and law enforcement. I'm proud to say that your Truckee firefighters are ready to respond day in, day out, rain, snow, or shine with full service fire, or excuse me, rain, snow, or shine to all emergencies. We are an all risk fire protection district with a full service fire prevention bureau and a newly created community inspired wildfire prevention division. This is super unique for this community. Uh, that was brought to you by Measure T. So our fire prevention teams, we work to stop fires before they start and the suppression guys are there after the fires start, and we try to keep them as small as possible. So one of my points of emphasis as a new fire chief is to take a look at critical infrastructure that resides in and transits our area and evaluate any impacts on our service delivery. As you know, Truckee houses many valuable assets that provide the framework for our economy and our lifestyle. We have Interstate 80, we got the Transcontinental Railroad, we got the uh, Solid Waste Transfer Station, we got the airport, the sewer plant, several dams and reservoirs, and that's just to name a few. Uh, with my background in civil engineering, I enjoy thinking about infrastructure and the interdependencies and the important connections that make the whole system function. So I've landed on four characteristics of these facilities that may impact service delivery for the fire district. First, the area of benefit is larger than the fire district. So as the facility size or use increases uh, in response to the needs of that benefit area, the fire district, we may not grow proportionally. And so this disproportional growth may impact our ability to deliver service. 
Uh, secondly, these facilities may expose our assets to hazards. So consider, for instance, maybe a train derailment in downtown Truckee or a commercial vehicle fire on Interstate 80. And that fire extends to the roadside vegetation and up towards one of our, our neighborhoods. Um, third, these facilities, they are valuable assets as well. And they need and consume fire protection services. You know, a fair amount of our total calls for service involve infrastructure in some way. You know, these are vehicle accidents, uh, power lines down, gas leaks, fire alarms, and again, that's just to name a few. And finally, and perhaps most important, these facilities are exempt from taxes. We get about 80% of our revenue from assessed value and property taxes. Unfortunately, infrastructure is not included in assessed value and does not pay property taxes. And so when it comes to critical infrastructure, we strive to ensure all required fire prevention measures are in place, practiced, and maintained. It's so important to leverage that, that fire prevention. But we also need to make sure that our response crews have all the information necessary to respond appropriately in the event of an emergency. So this is like pre-plans, training, and equipment. So I did want to talk a little bit about level of service. Uh, right after this meeting, I'm going to meet with the insurance service office. We call them ISO. So ISO rates fire departments on their projected ability to protect the community. Truckee Fire is currently rated as a four, which lands us in the middle both numerically and interesting sort of geographically for ISO protection class. To our south, there's North Lake Tahoe Fire Protection District. They serve Incline Village, and they have an ISO rating of one. That's the highest rating. And to our north, we have the rural Sierra Valley. Uh, they're protected by volunteer fire departments that likely have a much higher rating uh, on the order of eight or nine. So the rating is largely based on resource deployment. This is the ability to get a certain amount of equipment and personnel to the emergency scene within a given period of time in order to stop the progress of a fire. Uh, there is also a fair amount of credit giving, given to providing an emergency water supply. So ISO compares the fire department with the water supply, and if there's a discrepancy, points can be lost. <clears throat> this is referred to as divergence. Uh, we are impacted by this, likely due to the robust water system in Schaefer's Mill and Martyrs Camp with very little financial support for the fire district. You know, I hope we all understand that fire hydrants don't put fires out. You need firefighters and fire engines. Uh, Placer County may have had this misconception when they approved de development in the Martyrs Valley but didn't proportionally fund the fire district. At the end of the day, uh, revenue equals resource deployment, and resource deployment equals level of service. So uh, as our community grows, the fire district will need to grow with it in order to maintain level of service. Uh, currently, our fire stations are at capacity for equipment and personnel. We have plans to build a new fire station, Station 90, near the town corporation yard, which would help reduce the pressure on Stations 91 and 92. We developed a preliminary design for Station 90 with Ward Young Architects last year. Uh, Station 90 will benefit the community with better level of service in our downtown, our busy commercial core. And it will add much needed system resiliency. Unfortunately, we can't afford it. <clears throat> uh, current prices were about $15 million short. Uh, you know, we'll be looking into other funding sources, including state funding. Uh, Amador Fire received $8.1 million from the state uh, for a new fire station. Uh, we could request some money from Placer County, would, which might help with our divergence problem. Uh, then there's a FEMA program called BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. And then, of course, there's a capital facilities bond or maybe just saving money from the general fund. One minute. Okay. At the end of the day, we want to be the best fire department for our community. As stated earlier, we are extremely lucky to have great and talented staff. Our team is a coiled spring, ready to respond to all hazards at any time. 
Uh, the work they perform is dangerous and I will give my full measure when advocating for our staff. We are ve also very grateful to have an awesome board of directors. And I did want to take a quick moment during this election season to thank all of you that are participating in local government. I truly believe small town government and these face-to-face -face meetings are the bedrock for our democracy. As for the fire district board, I commend them for being both courageous and accessible. They took on a challenging issue with a campfire and barbecue ban and advocated for community safety. Getting in the middle of a man and his grill is dangerous ground. <laughs> But with our transient tourist population, our enormous values at risk, and the potential for catastrophic fire, it had to be done. Then our board was available and capable to respond to the community concerns of wildfire prevention and facilitated Measure T and the implementation of our new wildfire prevention division. The board also had the vision to fund this new division in advance of receiving the tax revenue from our operational reserve, showing their commitment to the community. So thank you for your time and uh, for the opportunity to present some of my ideas. Hopefully the road wasn't too bumpy. Mm -hmm. Kevin McKechnie, Truckee Fire Protection District, the fire chief, thank you. All right, now we have Jessica Penman, who as of October is uh, the new president and CEO of the Truckee Chamber of Commerce. So welcome, Jessica. Good morning. Um, I'm gonna go kind of quickly because we are running out of time and I wanna make sure we have time to hear from uh, you guys as well. So, uh, that's me, Jessica Pemmon. I am the new president and CEO of the Truckee Chamber of Commerce. This is day seven. Um, I was told, not asked, that I was going to speak this morning. So I uh, am going to speak a little bit more about who I am and where I've come from than necessarily where we're going, since that's still kind of yet to be seen. So if you want to scroll up. So my hometowns plural. Um, I grew up in Napa County in Napa Valley. Um, my parents moved there uh, when I was six months old on Christmas Eve. And on my 10th birthday, they bought a condo at the Tahoe Donnerski Bull Condos. Um, and recently, well, five years ago, uh, purchased a small house on Davos. So I have been coming to Truckee since I was 10 years old. Um, and it is one of my favorite places. You can see that's my mom and I when I'm 10 at the top of the ski hill during the summer. Um, and then it took me 35 years, but I did finally get a photo at the famous Napa Valley welcome sign. It's not really something you do as a local, um, but when you're moving away, you figure you should do it. So I went and took a photo. Um, I love this community and when the job came across my desk, I looked at my boss and I was like, oh no. And she's like, I know, I saw it. So this was the only place I thought I could ever live besides Napa County and I'm so excited to be here. If you wanna scroll up. So my education's a little weird uh, if you think about what I do for a living. So I went to the University of Arizona um, another school known for its academics, um, and <laughs> studied anthropology and classical civilizations. And then I went to the University of College London and got a master's degree in Egyptian archeology. span <laughs> Super useful, uh, let me tell you. Um, I have been teaching for the last eight years at the Napa Valley College, so I do kind of pay off my student loans with that money. Um, Currently not looking to teach, but maybe in the future, um, I taught introduction to archeology, span introduction to cultural anthropology, and then the anthropology of witchcraft, magic, and religion, uh, which was one of the most popular classes at the school. <laughs> you wanna scroll up? So there's some archeology span pictures to prove that I really did use my degree at some points in my life. Um, the top picture is me in Jericho uh, in Palestine. The bottom uh, one with me looking kind of Indiana Jones-esque is in Egypt. Um, I lived in Egypt for four months in the summer. Do not recommend that. Uh, working in South Assasif, which is on the uh, west bank of Luxor next to the Valley of the Queens. Um, and then the top one is in Modoc County uh, in California, and then that bottom one is in Italy. Um, so through archeology, span I've got to live in Italy, in Palestine, Egypt, and London. So if nothing else, it was a great uh, 
you know, experience for me to get to do even if I'm not doing it full time anymore. Scroll up. Uh, so my family is small. It's my boyfriend who Lynn told me to tell this to everybody needs a job. <laughs> so he works in project management. Let me know if you're looking. Um, and then our dog, Indiana Jones, uh, Indy for short, Dr. Indiana Jones, if he's in trouble. Um, and he is probably the most excited out of all of us to be living here. He loves the snow, hates to be cold, but loves the snow and loves the lake. So um, we also have a cat. She's not here yet, but uh, hopefully keep her inside. For fun, we like to do everything that kind of works with living in Truckee. Um, I'm an avid runner. I've run 16 half marathons. Um, I've done the Tahoe Ragnar once, and I will never do it again. Um, but it was an experience. Uh, we love to go camping and hiking. That's a photo from Jumbo Rocks in Joshua Tree, which we went to last year. Big skier. Um, my parents made me cross country ski since I could walk. And when we bought the condo, I was like, downhill only. So I only downhill ski now. Um, and then going, you know, living in Napa, wine is obviously a big part of my personality. Um, and wine and eating and cheese, um, all, all great things. And I'm really excited to explore the Truckee community's uh, restaurant scene a little bit more as well. So, the Yonville Chamber of Commerce. So, uh, I said I studied archaeology. Getting into chamber work probably seems a little unusual. Um, when I moved home from graduate school, I got a job at the Napa Valley Museum as their development director and then eventually as their interim um, ED and learned that I actually really like working with people that are still alive, not just people that have been buried for 2,000 years. Um, so I really uh, took an interest in our community in Napa, um, and when the opportunity came to work for the Yontville Chamber of Commerce, um, I jumped at it. They were a sleepy chamber, they hadn't really done anything in about 15 years, and the new president and CEO um, was looking to rebuild and build a team to do that. So uh, with her help um, and myself and another, we really took the chamber from almost nothing to what we now call the Chamber of Choice in Napa County. Um, we took the membership from 150 to over 300 now. We had a residence program, an associate program that I was in charge of. It had 17 households in it. Uh, when I left, it had 110, and that was with 40 new ones since the pandemic hit, since we did lose some of that during the pandemic. Um, I ran a volunteer program for our Welcome Center with 34 volunteers that we also kept all through COVID. Um, we redesigned and created a yauntvillechamber.com website that's won two awards through WACE, and I maintained that. We grew our social media following from basically nothing to the most in all of the county of Napa. Um, we launched TikTok right before I left, which was perfect timing for me. Um, <laughs> I worked on blogs for both our tourist site as well as our um, chamber site. Uh, like I mentioned, we increased our sales and membership exponentially um, over the last five years. Um, really, we came into our own during COVID with our communication strategy. Everyone in this room is going to quickly learn I over communicate. You're going to hear from the chamber more than you ever thought you needed to hear from the chamber because that's our job. Our job is to connect our businesses and our community and make sure that everybody knows what's happening. Um, and that is something I'm very passionate about. Um, we helped to create an economic transition plan coming out of COVID um, and made sure that our businesses were able to operate as they'd been allowed to operate during COVID. That included outdoor seating, um, you know, extra staff, things like that, that weren't necessarily in their permits. Um, helped to lead multiple industry groups um, to work around workforce development and economic development. Uh, when I left, we were currently in the final plans of actually creating the first workforce development strategy for Napa County in partnership with the county and our Office of Education. Napa was a little behind. We didn't have anything like that. Um, and then I've sat on so many uh, boards and community partners and things like that, and I'm very excited to start doing that again. I still currently sit as the vice president for the Napa Valley uh, Leadership Napa Valley Board. Um, I was on the Arts Commission in Yonville for five years, Arts and Culture Commission for seven years for the county. So looking forward to getting more involved in that. And then um, I'm also currently uh, doing our WACE, which is our trade organization for chambers. I'm on their emerging leader. 
uh, Council as well right now and I'm going to their strategic retreat next week. So I'm excited to see what other communities, uh, chambers are doing, what we can bring back to that. There's my contact information. That's my direct line that forwards to my cell phone. Um, I'm really looking forward in the next 90 days to getting to meet with the membership and our community leaders. Please reach out to schedule a meeting. I already have lunches every day for the next two weeks. So, um, you know, I'm very excited to hit the ground running. Um, and if you are available, if you want to hear more chamber things, um, Lynn and Emily will be presenting tonight at four o'clock at the council meeting um, from everything that we did last year and then also some strategic initiatives moving forward. And I did it. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica Penman. As a, a member of the uh, chamber board, we're really glad to have you on board. So thank you. All right, we're going to stump speeches. We don't have a lot of time this morning. So if you have a stump speech, keep it short. Start here. Do you have a mic? Yeah, you're welcome to come up. Just come on in. That's why I sat here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Karen Wilcutts with the North Lake Tahoe Truckee Leadership Program. I'm excited to announce that we are now accepting applications for our 2023 class. The Leadership Program is an adult leadership program that teaches leadership skills and introduces, uh, hi Susan, different community topics in order to build stronger leaders and a healthier community. So, Lynn, uh, it's a partnership between the Truckee Chamber, the uh, North Lake Tahoe Resort Association, and the North Tahoe Business Association. Lynn Saunders started it uh, in 2004. And so, Lynn, I wanted to show you, since you are leaving tomorrow, how impactful this program has been to the community, and I need your guys' help. So, please stand up and remain standing if you are an alumni of the program. If you are a partner of the program, that's you, Jessica, stand up. If you have sent somebody through the program, if you have thought about sending somebody through the program, <laughs> if you have spoken or worked with me, Susan, Carolina, Rory, stand up. Uh, and if you have heard about the program, please stand up. So Lynn, you did this over the past almost 20 years, and uh, I want to thank you for your leadership um, and, uh, uh, and show how much we appreciate you. And apply if you haven't taken it. You can go to TahoeTrekkieLeadership.com. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, come on up. Thanks, Raven. I'm Jess Carr. Al alumni of the North Lake Tahoe Truckee Leadership Program. Also work for Sierra Business Council, the Small Business Development Center. Hi, Leslie. Uh, I am just coming up to talk about Tahoe Pitch Camp, which actually starts next week, but we are still accepting applications. It's a four workshop series in person pitch camp. So it's for entrepreneurs to hone their pitches, which are five minute speeches for investment. And it will culminate in the Tahoe Pitch Showcase, which will happen here in this room on November 14th, which is a Monday night, uh, where those selected finalists, we think five, will be pitching to the community and you have the opportunity to vote on who you think is the best. So it's really fun. If you have anyone that you know that might be interested in going through the camp, still accepting applications, it's free. The showcase, fun for everyone to come see what their community members are doing uh, in the business world. Thanks. Hi, I'm Susan Safpour. I want to tell you a little bit about the awesome Ta Truckee Tahoe Pickleball Club. We formed in partnership with the Truckee Donner Recreation and Park District to uh, bring pickleball to Truckee. The goal is to build courts at Riverview Park right up, right up the road. And we started in June when the district designated land. In July, they gave us money. So we're, we're a startup, it's only October, but we have already done so much. We've designed hats, we've got t-shirts, we have 115 members in our club. We've had two events, we've talked to a million businesses downtown, had almost 40 give raffle items. Uh, so we've done raffles and we have five major grants out. Um, 
more than 350,000 being requested. It will be the basis of, of raising the money to build the courts, but we're also going to need community support. We got huge community support last week when Nate Rupert of Rupert Construction agreed to do all the dirt work for us. That is tremendous. Uh, we've also hired, well, the board has, I keep pointing at Kristen, thank you so much for everything. Um, the board has also hired a landscape architect who will be meeting with doing designs and starting permits. And we'll have some really pretty pictures to show in about a month. But what we need today is everyone to sign our petition for a grant that's going into Placer County. We're trying to get as many signatures as we possibly can from as many cities, cities in the area and hoping that we'll have one more big grant in the pipeline. Thank you so much. Tell your friends, follow us on Facebook, join the club, give donations. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Siobhan Kenny with Visit Trekkie Tahoe. I'm excited to tell you about Visit Trekkie Tahoe's Sustainable Trekkie Fall Lodging Offer. The offer gives visitors a $100 gift, Sustainable Trekkie gift card for booking two or more nights of lodging between September 28th and December 21st. And in addition to the offer, we also launched a friends and family referral program for Trekkie Tahoe locals. So any local who successfully refers a friend to our offer, our fall lodging, offer can get a $50 Sustainable Trekkie gift card of their own. And Sustainable Trekkie gift cards are community-based digital gift cards. They're redeemable at 50 Trekkie-owned and operated businesses. Um, and every single card sold supports stewardship. So visit Trekkie Tahoe. We match 25% of every card sold for stewardship projects. Um, and it might surprise you to know that so far since our formation, we've contributed over $330,000 in funding for sustainable Trekkie stewardship projects, such as trailhead ambassadors, trailhead signs, and even um, the TART microtransit shuttle that was um, running around this summer. So if you'd like to learn more about the referral program, we hope that you'll tell a friend and you can go to visit trekkietahoe.com slash refer a friend. Thank you. Okay, any more stump speeches? If, oh, all right, come on up. I'm just going to stand right here. Yes, perfect. Um, <laughs> right, we're going to go into the raffle, so get out your raffle tickets. But before that, just wanted to thank Lynn Saunders, the outgoing chamber president and CEO, for everything she's done. All these good morning truckies, all the hard work. Thank you, Lynn. And next, uh, next second Tuesday at 7 in the morning, you're off the hook. You don't have to be here, so sleep in. The rest of you need to be here. <laughs> All right. We are going to start with a trucky mug and return ticket to this very program, which will be next month for the annual ski resort roundup. So that's always a good one. We are going to go four, six, eight, nine, six, four. All right. Have a trucky hat here. Hunting colors. Ted, this has your name on it, I think. We're going to go 468. Oh, that one's too close. Ah, oh, it's already in my hand. Okay, 468 965. All right. Snooze, you lose. 469. Zero, one, zero. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Ruth, you want to show us the trucky tote here? PEO. All 
right. Oh, a lot of oohs and ahs. Okay. Here we go then. This is exciting. Four, six, eight, nine, eight, eight. Trucky tote. Ethan. All right. Yeah. Take that to court to your next appearance. <laughs> and Grizzly Menswear, $25 gift card. They moved downtown. This is going to go to 469018. 469018. Oof. It's a Bad one to miss. All right. You all are still in the running. Four, six, eight, nine, nine, five. All right. Welcome. <laughs> and finally, One ticket to this Thursday's October 13th Historical Haunted Tour at 5.30, which is sold out. This is a $65 value. I'll really mix this up here. 468971. Okay, Mary. <laughs> there you go. Congrats. All right, and before we close, I just want to announce that there's a Truckee Chamber mix, excuse me, mixer on Thursday, October 20th at the Piper J Gallery, which is the new art gallery on West River Street. So hopefully a number of you can show up. And with that, we are going to close. Uh, I'm Raven Whittington of Porter Simon. I hope to see you here next month. And thanks for coming out early this morning and joining in person. Take care. Good morning, Truckee.